Okay, here we are again, uh, two days uh, after England uh, played France and rather disappointingly went out of the tournament, losing 3-0. Uh, James, what were your observations about that match from an England point of view? Um, I, was, I suppose the thing that stood out for me was um, in all areas of the competitive nature of the game, England seemed to come off second best. Yeah. Um, I think France looked uh, stronger, um, they looked more sort of powerful in the challenges. And I, th I, I don't think that's for any lack of commitment or desire from the England team. I'm trying to put them down in that respect. So I, yeah. I got the impression, I don't know how right I am with this, I just got the impression that maybe it could have been that sort of element of match fitness and match sharpness which was possibly yeah. lacking from the England side, which, which kind of resulted in not living up to the full potential, not sort of meeting the, uh, you know, the standards that they know they're capable of. Yeah, I mean, I must admit, watching that match against France, you know, because we're all really rooting that they could uh, get through, uh, even if they drew, but... Um, it was a very uncharacteristic performance by England, really across the tournament, um, but uh, it was underlined against France. They did look like they were lacking in ideas and physical strength all the way through the team. Um, and yet we've seen this same team play well before. They've won the Cyprus Cup, uh, they got to the Euro Finals um, in 2009 against Germany. You don't get there by luck, um, and, and we're talking the same players. So I guess the question is naturally going to come up about whether match fitness played a part and, and to what extent that might have uh, knocked the equilibrium. But it, it's a difficult judgment call, isn't it, when you've got experienced players there that are lacking match fitness yeah. versus playing you know, up-and-coming players who perhaps don't have the tournament experience. It's a very fine balance, isn't it? I mean, we, we said it in previous videos, we wanted to see players like Jordan Lobsgate go. Yes. Um, because yes. she's certainly a player with um, you know, bags of potential. Um, but obviously Hope Powell favoured the more experienced players, the likes of your Farrah Williams, Jill Scott. Now I was really impressed with Jill Scott, I thought she did really well in the yeah. tournament. Um, it, but you can't leave it down to like, the odd player here and there. I, I think collectively as a team, um, yeah. as a whole, we underperformed. Yeah. Um, but I don't, I don't want to ignore st you know, standout performances in certain aspects of the game. Like I said, Jill Scott was one. Yes. I thought Karen Barsley had um, good periods of a lot of games. Yeah. Um, so it wasn't all negative, there is still a lot of positive to be taken out of it. Absolutely, and I think the the most important thing is something certainly you know within my own business of coaching clients that we go through is is about recovering from disappointment. And I think the most important thing is you know any team can have a bad day at the office, whether it's injury or just not performing. And certainly, what's not in question is their effort, as far as we're concerned. Uh, the effort was there, but you know other things were lacking, and that can happen to the best of teams. Uh, but what's important now is how they reflect with accuracy on what's just gone before and how they move from that point of reflection to prepare themselves for the next thing which is now the World Cup uh, qualifiers and of course in between their club games. Well I think that this is a key thing is um, these girls made it into the England team because they perform well at their respective WSL clubs. Uh, they're going to go back to these clubs for the next two months um, because we've got two months before the, the World Cup qualifiers start. Yeah. Um, they've got two months to go back to these clubs, regain that sort of confidence and belief in their ability, yeah. um, regain that match fitness and sharpness um, with their clubs, then come back in two months' time, ready, all guns blazing, to attack those World Cup qualifiers and set themselves you know, well on the road towards qualification for that World Cup. Yeah, absolutely, and that's crucial now. As you say, we can't undo what's gone before. A disappointing tournament, but what matters is now. So, um, you know, the, the main thing is how they reflect how they pick themselves up, how they prepare themselves. Unfortunately, there's not too much of a time gap. September is when they play Belarus uh, down in Bournemouth, so, you know, we'll be behind them for that. Um, but just, you know, uh, looking at the other teams like France and Spain that have been up and coming, um, there's been a lot of comments about, you know, the investment in the game and, um, you know, players who play part-time and... and, and those teams that are training twice a day. Do you think there is that disparity uh, between us and a lot of the other European clubs now? Or? Um, well, I, I read in um, Casey Stoney's blog and she mentioned um, the, the France side that beat England the other day. Um, a number of their players have played for, I believe it's Lyon, who got through to the um, final of the Champions League in the women's game. And those players, they're full-time. Um, they've obviously got more... Um, more time, money invested into them, yeah. and it's paid dividends because look at that France side now. Look at look at how yeah. efficient and effective they were. Yeah. Um, they're a very well-oiled sort of machine. Um, I think. I mean, I, I hate getting into the bureaucracy side of things, but I do think if England wants to improve, yeah. you've got to put more in to get more out. Yes. Um, and that's got to come from somewhere. And the place where it's obviously got to come from for me is 
from the top from the FA and it's got to you know, hit the England side now but also the grassroots as well. Yeah, and at a time where England you know, and women's football is getting more coverage on the TV, I guess there's that added layer of pressure for them because some of them are part-time, others have got contracts. Uh, that pressure to perform uh, so that they can add to the momentum of what they've already achieved. But I guess in the context that we've just talked about, it makes their achievements so far, uh, you know, uh, that much greater given the limitations that they, they work under. Um, so, who are the standout players for you in England? Because, you know, there were some notable performances. Oh, definitely. Um, I think, uh, if, if we start at the back, I thought um, over the course of the tournament, Karen Barsley had a good tournament. I know people always look at that um, last-minute goal against Spain, mm -hmm. and so for me it's not about focusing at the one moment, it's focusing about the, yeah. the, over the three games. I thought she did very well. She made some very good saves. Um, I thought Jill Scott in the middle of the pitch um, was she was just everywhere. I think um, we decided she was our player yeah, of, of the tournament for England. Yeah. I completely agree. Um, she's the one player that seemed to really do her best to grab the game by the scruff yeah. of the neck. Um, I think Ellen White ran her socks off, but unfortunately it's no avail. Um, and again, when Tony Duggan came on, I was really impressed with her. Again, bags of energy, ran her yeah. socks off, and um, I was really pleased that she got a goal as well. Yeah, excellent. So. Anyway, we're going to look forward to the, the, the next event, which of course is the World Cup qualifiers, and we'll be continuing to follow England uh, on their journey through and, and supporting them and, uh, and looking to help to you know, raise their profile through our support and um, uh, through watching their progress uh, from here on. So Definitely. stay tuned.